Okay. So I can't teach you how to become self-actualized because only you can do that. I'm not you. You are yourself. You have to know yourself in order to become self-actualized. All that I can do is share how I reached that point in hopes that you're able to take from my experience to learn from and to add to yours so that hopefully you wouldn't have to go through the same mistakes that I made. However, in my experience and in everyone that I've ever met who is also self-actualized experiences, it would seem that um, at least where we are right now, part of the process comes through trauma. Okay, so this is going to get Baltimore. Baltimore. Um, uh, where do I even begin? I feel like I'm going to end up jumping around regardless because it's a lot to take on to um, go through those experiences as they were happening. Like it's almost easier, you know, to um, be able to talk about the things that I've already processed and then just just jump around that way. Um, especially when it comes to self-actualization. It, so I didn't in the last video and wasn't intending to, I try not to in my videos use people's actual names um, because I'm not trying to call people out, right? But I think it's just, it's easier and it's um, like necessary in the story to be able just to say his name. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, okay, so like I said in my first video, when I first started talking to Kevin, um, he seemed to be right on board with, with what I was uh, trying to do with my life. He also seemed... But I just accepted that he was more intelligent than I am. Um, so I kind of uh, let him take the lead in different ways. While I was in myself still processing my own sense of independence, you know, the reason that I was, I was trying to go out onto the road in the first place was to claim some sense of independence that I hadn't had yet. So... He, in his theology and tradition, took that uh, innately as a rebellion. But like I said, abuse, you know, happens over a progression. Um, so although he expressed those things in different ways when I was first with him, He was weirdly controlling, but I didn't receive it that way. I did. I didn't receive it as a red flag, though. I did. But I still made allowances for it. It seemed mostly harmless, despite my intuition screaming at me. Um, when I started talking to him, uh, we talked about how we intended the relationship to go. Um, it was not set to be a particularly romantic relationship. It was set to be a partnership with an end goal of self-actualization. Um, we called it self-sustainment. Um, but I realize now that it was, I mean, even then we didn't have the word self-actualization, but that's what we meant by it. 
um, the point was to come into our own selves through the process and to kind of show that um, self-sustainability was possible. Um, So we talked in depth about those things prior to meeting. We also talked in depth about uh, the expectancies of the relationship. Um, He, I didn't really have an expectation to begin with outside of, I just, I just was told I needed a man to go with me. So I was just looking for somebody that wanted the same things that I wanted, uh, that was able to kind of deter other men, um, away from me. And he had very set standards, um, for what he he was looking for in his life and what he was looking for in a partner um, in this in this degree. And so I, at the time, up until that point and at the time, I was just, like I said, pretty much completely checked out. Um, I had never checked in. I was not self-aware at this point, um, never had been fully, and um, didn't know it. I I didn't realize that it was even like a thing. Um, I was a people pleaser to a fault um, to the degree that I identified myself by my capacity to be able to compromise and sacrifice myself for the benefit of others. I took that on as an identity. That was, that was my identity at the time. Um, so his rigid standards were, it really didn't matter how oppressive or controlling they seemed on the surface. I was completely willing to receive them with a sense of submission. But like I said, at the same time, I was also fighting for my independence. So there was a bit of rebellion in it. At the same, I mean, not that I needed to follow this random stranger's rules, you know what I mean, or like have him tell me anything. But at the same, uh, I learned a lot through the experience that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. I don't think so. It is what it is. But um, when we had first been talking before he came to get me, I was still hanging out with my ex-husband, who, um, after we had separated, he had been interested in. A girl already I'm pretty sure it was a girl that he worked with um, but very shortly after we had separated and moved apart from each other we we lived together for like three months after we separated um, until I had moved out and as soon as I had moved out um, he moved into a, a rent to own house and started dating this girl um, so he was actively dating her and we were still hanging out which was fine for a time, um, but it, it was on the premise like he kind of assumed that we would, once once we got over the emotions of the separation, that we would be with each other casually, sexually. And once I told him that that wasn't going to be happening, like you're not <laughs> you're not going to turn your ex wife into your mistress while you have a straight up other girlfriend, like the fuck. And then he was like, well, then I guess we don't need to be friends at all. And I was like, okay. So apparently the friendship that I thought that we were building outside of our marriage uh, wasn't that. Um, It was just what he thought would be a bridge to a casual sexual relationship. And that wasn't what I wanted with him. Um, It's my fucking ex-husband. But uh, prior to that, we were hanging out with each other and building what I thought was a friendship. And... um, I had started talking to Kevin, so I was talking to my ex-husband about it. And he was like, well, I'm happy for you that you're that you're doing what you think you need to do with your life and that, that you're finding yourself. And I think those are all really good things. But he warned me. He's like, men are crazy. People are crazy, but men are crazy. And he was like, you know, just be careful because, like, a dude will travel – 
all the way across the country just to be with a girl and use her, you know, if he can't find something else. And like, you don't really know this dude. So like, as much as you're getting to know him online, give yourself some time to get to know him in person before you're with him sexually. That was his advice, which was super solid advice and extremely um, loving coming from somebody who I really didn't receive much love from. Um, But I didn't listen to him because I had already, in discussing how the relationship would go with Kevin, decided that, well, and this came also through his, I mean, I, yeah, like I was still, you know, in the beginning points of recovery from being a sex addict. Um, And his concept was, well, it's pretty inevitable that there's going to be sexual tension between us. So we should just bang right off the bat. And then we can put that on the back burner um, because we've already been there, already known each other that way. And then we can pursue a different relationship. Um, So that was the plan. I wasn't in a healed enough space to even be able to offer that, to be honest, but I had considered myself capable of that, that sort of discipline. I never had attempted it yet, to be honest. And I, I was, I was just happy to be with somebody else, to be honest, um, too until I met him. So he showed up at like two or three in the morning. That was the time that he had gotten there after driving the, you know, 18 hours or 20 hours or whatever it was to get from Baltimore to Wisconsin. And, um, like I said, as soon as he got out of the car, I was taken aback with, um, a really, really uncomfortable vibe. I was immediately like the, this just ain't right and he immediately was like okay let's go fine let's go into the field (laughs) like he literally grabbed like came out with a blanket wrapped around him which already weirded me out like he wasn't carrying it he wrapped it around his shoulders and like came up to me and was like all right let's go find somewhere to lay down and fuck and he's like talking all fancifully And I was just nervous as hell. Um, I was not known for being nervous when it came to sexual things. It was trained into me to be uh, unnaturally comfortable um, being received sexually or being pursued sexually or offering myself sexually. But this just didn't, it was different. And... I didn't know how to say it. And the whole time that we were walking to the field, I was just like, how am I going to tell this dude that I'm, I'm not into this right now? Because my fear then too was like, I was feeling all these crazy vibes. I also felt extremely bad because I was like, I let this dude literally come all the way from Baltimore to Wisconsin to pick me up. We already had these plans that these are how things were going to go. Boom, boom, boom. This is how it's supposed to be. I'd already, you know, agreed that I would be submissive to these things that I was gung-ho about you know following these these standards and rules we had set for the relationship and I just felt so not about it by the time he showed up and it wasn't even like the nervousness of all of it it was like the second he got out of the car I just caught his vibes and I was like this ain't right I was literally excited about it up until then nervous but anxious but like excited until he got out of the car And uh, we got into the field and he laid the blanket down and he laid on it and like kind of laid back and was waiting for me basically to pounce. And I stood there super uncomfortably. And I was like, I, um, I'm not, I'm not ready. And he gave me this look that was, both confusion, frustration, um, skepticism, an immediate bitterness, like if it, like an immediate anger about it. Um, I think he he caught the vibes that I wasn't comfortable with him, not not the situation, not just 
didn't have a problem having casual sex immediately with anybody. That was that was never a problem for me, to be honest. I'm not bragging about that. It's not a good thing. You should definitely know who it is that you're engaging with in those ways. Sex is incredibly sacred and intimate. You shouldn't just receive energy from just anybody without knowing them. But having been a sex addict and a pervert, that was part of like almost like a kink for me was to not know somebody and to completely pervert the sanctity of sex in that way. Um, that was something I got off on. I had had multiple one night stands at that point um, for that exact purpose. People I wasn't even interested in, didn't care about being with after that. I just wanted that quick bang. And that's how I treated this until I caught those vibes, I, which I had never gotten from somebody this way prior. And, um, yeah, so he looked at me like, and he was like, okay, well, let's go to the car and smoke pot. And, you know, we can talk for a while and then we'll fuck. But he was still dead set on, like, we need to get this done right away. I was like, okay, yeah, maybe maybe smoking will chill me out. So we got into the car, and we smoked, and we talked. And uh, we talked for a while, like maybe two hours. And he was fine with it, but at the same time, like, a lot of it revolved around, like, the importance of me submitting and being like just trusting him fully, just giving myself to him fully and letting him uh, make these decisions and letting him use me the way that he intended that that was part of this process. And like I said, like he had gotten really fucked up with that girl. So like ever since he was fucked up with her, like he kept talking about this like game that he had for me or like this like plan that he had for me. And like, you know, she, she, like I was like talking about her. I like brought her up. And he was like, she's just a white rabbit. She was like, she's part of, she's supposed to be a distraction for you. Like she's supposed to be something that I put in the way for you to work through. I understood all of that. Um, Even that I feel like needs explaining because I don't think most people have been inundated to... um, the tactics of MK Ultra, which is essentially what was happening. Um, it's a it's a system of brainwashing. If you've all uh, this stuff is so deep, and I'm gonna have to talk about all of this in a totally different video because, like, if you've been marked for it, then. I, This game, he seemed to already know these things. And I fully accepted that he was my new handler because I was already inundated to these things. People that know what I'm talking about and know what I'm talking about, people that don't are probably like, what the fuck is she even talking about? (laughs) But, um, I already knew that this is how it was supposed to be. So I wasn't fighting it, and he knew I wasn't fighting it. He was making sure I wasn't fighting it. I was just trying to understand. That was always a huge thing for me was I'll do anything. I'll do anything my handler tells me to do as long as I understand why I'm being told these things. You can straight up lie to me, but as long as you're giving me information to process and I'm actively processing, I will do the thing. This is how I was trained. It was not hard for me to fall into these systems with him because I'd already been trained these ways. So we're talking and he's explaining and I'm processing. And as that's happening, the sun started to come up, you know, so now it's probably like 5 a.m., you know, close to, close to 6, something like that. And um, as we're talking, I'm I'm high. I think we smoked two bowls because I still wasn't comfortable after the first. 
And I was like, you know, I just, I smoke a lot. So like, I'm not, I don't really feel it. I was just trying to buy my time at that point. I was so uncomfortable. And then I was just really fucking high. And as the sun was coming up, I remember looking at his face and as the light continued to change over like that 40 minutes of sunrise or however long, you know, maybe it was less. Um, but as the sun was rising, it was casting different shadows on his face. And it was almost like every time I looked at him, he looked like a different person. Dude, this shit is so deep. Um, I was terrified. I was terrified, but I already knew I'd, I'd, already, I'd already signed up for this. I'd already agreed to it. And there was no concept of how to escape. There was only the concept that I have to, like I said, bite the bullet and, and swallow this, that this is, this is part of my destiny. This is what I have to do. One point he just got to the point where he's like, all right, get naked, get undressed. And he got completely undressed before I'd even taken a single item of clothing off. I remember seeing him there naked, ready to have me. And I was just honestly disgusted more with myself. But I got undressed and we had sex. I don't even know how long it lasted. I dissociated. We got dressed again, got out of the car. I don't know if we just like talked for a while before we eventually went inside. Told my parents, you know, that he was there, that I was going to be leaving. Went through the whole process of them not being comfortable with that, you know, being like, we don't, we don't want this dude in our house. Um, him and my dad started fighting. Um, I don't even remember if we had like, if it was like over the course of multiple days or not. But I remember at one point um, being, this was when my parents lived in a town home in Bristol. And um, we, Kevin and I were sitting on the couch and my dad was talking to him. And my dad was like trying to be really understanding and trying to be helpful and realized that like I had only done what he had asked by finding somebody, you know, to, to, to go with. And this dude was now there to take me. And so he was like trying to give us advice, like, well, you should go here. And if you go, if you end up in Texas, like I have all these different places that you can go. And if you end up here in New Mexico, I have these different places that you should go and, or whatever. And like, you know, make sure that you do this and make sure that you do this. And at one point I'd said something and Kevin snapped at me about it. Which like I already within, I mean, that was, that was what was taking me so long to have sex with him. After having sex with him, I, I completely submitted. So at that point, like I did not respond to him snapping at me. I responded with submission the way that I'd been trained to. That's why I was holding off on it, because I didn't want to submit to him, but I just knew I had to, or felt I had to. So he snapped at me, and I shut up, put my head down, let him talk for me. And my dad saw that, and he was like, hey, don't talk to my daughter that way in my house. And Kevin was like, you don't get to tell me what to do. I'm a grown man, and she's a grown woman, and she's made the decision to submit to me, so like, fuck you essentially. They kind of fought about it. And then my dad was like, I don't want this dude in my house. And that's, you know, and I was like, okay, well then we'll just live in the car until we figure it out and we'll just go from there. And that's when they were like, okay, you know, please don't do this. <laughs> like send this dude away and stay here. You know, you can take your time to figure it out and go out again after that. And, uh, I just, 
and know how to speak up for myself fully. So like, even though I was actively trying to, I'd already fallen into this system again. So we went to Kevin's house with his parents, Kevin's parents' house rather. And um, his parents told us that we weren't allowed to sleep together in their house. We didn't follow that rule, but sleeping, act, act, actively sleeping together, um, we weren't allowed to do unless it was on the couch. But if we had to progress to that point. The initial um, rule was that we had to sleep in separate rooms. So he had me sleep in his room while he slept on the couch. Now, his room was kind of like off limits, right? Like his mom... He had already trained his mom not to go in his room and to leave him alone because that was his space. He had art on the walls. He already had drawn on the walls and had some art on the walls. He had some hung, a couple hung paintings. He was an incredible artist, really incredible. Um, his artist alias was Kid. And um, his art was, was beautiful and very interesting. Um, and I learned a lot from him artistically and musically, for sure. Um, but he had already gotten rid of most of it. I don't think he even had a lot of things to begin with. I think he'd already been in this process of kind of selling things. I didn't know at the time, I'm gonna turn this light on because it's getting dark. Um, so I was not privy at all at the time. Um, is that going to be bright enough? It don't matter. I was not privy at the time to, um, drug use, to, to hard drug use at all. Um, I'd had multiple friends at this point OD and pass away, mostly on heroin, um, I had had close friends um, doing it, but I was never really around. I hadn't seen anybody shoot up or anything like that. Like I wasn't around it. I had friends that popped pills, friends that did like oxys and stuff like that, Xanax and stuff. Um, and I'd seen them on those things, but I'd never really been around it. Um, I'd been ex exposed to it in different ways or offered it in different ways. But when I had said no, then, you know, they, they kept those things away from me for the most part. And, um, yeah, my concept of things at the time, like I didn't recognize drug abuse. I recognized mental illness. So often when people were actually fucked up because of drugs, I assumed that they were fucked up because of trauma and mental illness. So that was kind of the way I received him, although I know now that it was drugs. Um, but I didn't know while I, was, while I was with him. I didn't know the majority of the time that I was with him and it actually took like close until I w had left that I realized like, oh, okay, this dude is more fucked up than I thought. Um, drugs are scary to me, to be honest. Um, but I can see now like that, that that's probably in part why he had the setup that he had. Um, he basically had nothing in his room. It was a, a small room. Um, maybe like eight by 10, Something like that. It was a very, it was a small room, wood floor. Like I said, he had, he had art on the walls that he had drawn directly on the walls. And then he had art hung up, um, little, uh, just a couple pieces. And he had stuff in his closet, which was open, you know, and it was, it was super organized. Um, but aside, pretty much you walked in and all you saw was nothing, just a wood floor. Um, he had a yoga mat in the closet that he slept on. So he would take that out, unroll it and sleep on that. 
Um, because I was sleeping in that, he was sleeping on the couch. So I was sleeping on this yoga mat on the ground. Um, and in this room. So it slowly started off with us, like, first it was, it was fun, right? Like we were trying to figure out, make plans of how we were going to go out and what we were going to do. And we were like, okay, well, we should probably make a bunch of art so that we have stuff to sell and then we can make art on the way, but we should have stuff that we can actually bring with us. Um, so we started making art together and his dad actually turned uh, this little closet. His dad had a workspace down in the basement because his dad makes um, custom guitars. So he had this entire workspace down in the basement where he had like, you know, all of his, all of his materials and all of his wood carving materials and different stuff like that. And then he had a little closet down there that he had had materials in and he actually cleaned that out and turned it into a little art space for us, which was incredibly kind. His parents were really trying to make me comfortable because as soon as I got there, they were like, this girl's seemingly normal. Like we should help her out. They could just tell that it was a weird situation and they wanted me to feel comfortable, you know? So like both of his parents tried very hard to make me comfortable in different ways. And I do believe that his dad did that for me. And